Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 3130, Modern Geometries for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misselnine. In lecture six, we're going to introduce um, Hilbert's incidence axioms. Uh, we've explored now four distinct models of finite geometry in previous lectures. We have our three-point geometry, our four-point geometry, we have Fano geometry, and young geometry and my students would have been exploring other finite geometries in their homework assignments like five point geometry for example so although these different geometries express some very different properties like fano geometry young geometry demonstrates some very different properties when it came to parallel lines the existence of them and such there were many theorems and properties that remain true for all of these finite geometries. These common properties give rise to the so-called incidence axioms. Uh, and those common theorems were in fact the consequences of the four axioms of incidence. Okay, remember incidence here is the relationship between a point and a line. Uh, we say a point is incident to a line. It's an undefined term, but intuitively trying to think of the, the point is on the line, things like that. Uh, so these four axioms of incidence are going to be due to David Hilbert. Um, they're part of the Hilbert axioms of Euclidean geometry. We'll talk about that in much more detail in the future. But for the current moment, um, Hilbert categorized his axioms of Euclidean geometry into various families. We have the incidence axioms, which we're going to talk about in this video. There's the betweenness axioms, sometimes called the order axioms, which we will talk about later in this lecture series. The congruence axioms and the continuity axiom, plus also the parallel axioms. The parallel axioms we'll talk about later. Um, all of the axioms of Hilbert we'll talk about later as we build towards Euclidean geometry. Um, and so in this lecture, I want to establish the four axioms of incidence. And essentially, every geometry we talk about in the future will be an incidence geometry. The only exception to that we will provide will both basically just be counterexamples uh, for statements about incidence geometry. That is to say, we want to provide examples that, oh, this is a theorem or whatever, and we'll use them as these counterexamples. We'll just, we'll keep it simple like that. So there's four axioms of incidence geometry. Um, I believe Hilbert just labeled them I1, I2, I3, I4. That feels a little impersonal and sterile. Um, so instead, we're going to add some colorful names to them. And as we refer to these axioms in the future, we'll always refer to them as these names. And this is not a standard uh, naming system. So it's it's somewhat unique to this lecture series. So as you get deeper, deeper into the lecture series, uh, these names will be, you'll be quite uh, affectionate to them, I'm sure. So the first axiom of incidence, we are going to refer to it as line determination. For each two distinct points, there exists a unique line containing both of them. Nearly every finite geometry we've discovered um, in the lecture series, I can't think of an, of an counterexample of this, had this as an axiom. For Fano geometry and Young geometry, this was verbatim axiom four. For three-point geometry and four-point geometry, while I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, uh, these were verbatim, or at least something uh, phrased slightly different but equivalent to what we have right here. These were an axiom given to those geometries. This is a very important, um, this is a very important axiom for for geometry because it really tells us the relationship between points and lines. And the reason I call it line determination is the following idea. If we have two points, P and Q, there's often a common phrase, at least when one talks about uh, like elementary geometry in the United States here, we often say the phrase that two points determine a line. That is, if you have two points, there's only one line on both of them. There's at least one line, but it's also unique. There's not a second line that passes through these points. You don't get something like this. Um, and so this is line determination. Two points determine a line. That's how we want to think of this. And an alternative geometry without this axiom, that could be a possibility that there could be multiple lines between points, or maybe there's no line between a point. Not the case here. Because of line determination, any two points have a unique line um, incident to both of them. Then our second axiom, we're going to call it secant C. Secant C says that every for every line, there exists at least two points on it. Every line has at least two points. So that this, I don't want you to confuse this with axiom one here because axiom one says you start off with two points. There's exactly one line between them for which that line will have two points. But what about a line that exists, but its existence was not determined per se by points? Could there be a line um, with only one point on it? 
for which Axiom 1 wouldn't apply to that line because uh, there's only one line on it, or, or one point on it. Or could there be a pointless line, a line without any points on it whatsoever? Well, the C-can't-C axiom uh, says that all lines have at least two points. There could be more. There could be infinite for all we know. Uh, but C-can't-C guarantees that every line has at least two two points. So you don't have a one point line. You don't have a pointless line. And the reason we call it secant C, um, this is just a, a geometric metaphor. Remember a secant line is a line that intersects a circle at two distinct points. There's at least two points of intersection. I mean, for a circle, that's the maximum there, but that's where this term secant C coming from, um, that the points are going to cut the line. All right. Um, axiom three uh, tells us well, we call it point existence. It says there exist at least three points in the geometry. Uh, there exist at least three points. So we have at least three points, something like this. There could be more, there could be infinite, there could be four, there could be 17 points, whatever. Uh, there's at least three points. Every geometry really needs some type of axiom of existence. When we looked at three-point geometry and four-point geometry, there were axioms that said things like there's exactly three, there's exactly four, which of course means there's at least three in that situation. Those are stronger conditions than the point existence we take on now. Um, when we came to Fano geometry and uh, Young geometry, we didn't say that points existed. We said lines existed, but we had statements similar to secant C um, in Fano geometry and in Young geometry, we had an axiom that said all lines have exactly three points, which is a strengthening of this statement. If you have exactly three, then you have at least two. It's just more specific. And so because lines exist and lines have points, points exist, and we can get point existence from that situation. So my point is uh, that with all these geometries, there's some statement of existence. If you don't have a guarantee that points or lines exist, then you might just have the empty geometry, which is not super exciting because there's no points or no lines. Um, you also could have, could you have points without lines? Well, because you have points and because you have line determination, lines have to exist as well. Um, or the other way around, if you have lines and secancy, then point has to exist as well. So secancy and line determination tell us there's a relationship between lines and points. Line determination gets us from points to lines. Secancy gets us from lines to points. And then point existence tells us that there exists a point. And since we can go from points to lines, we have lines as well. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'm starting to prove things about uh, the incidence axioms. We'll get to that in the next video. Um, the last axiom of incidence, number four, I'm going to call this non-collinearity. Remember that points are collinear if they live on the same, if they're incident to the same line. Non-collinearity non says that not all points live on the same line. If I take the set of all points, that is a non-collinear set. There is no line that contains all of those points. And this was also often taken as an axiom uh, for many of the finite geometries we studied um, as we went forward. I, I, if I remember correctly, uh, if I'm incorrect, you don't have to correct me here, but I think on Young and Fano geometry, this was axiom three um, of our axioms. And then with three point and four point, they might've had something similar to that. I don't recall off the top of my head, I do apologize. But these are the four axioms of incidence established by uh, David Hilbert, for which if a, if a geometry satisfies these four axioms, we call it an incidence geometry. Some people call it a linear geometry or a linear space. I prefer to avoid that term because it starts to sound a lot more like a vector space, like from linear algebra. And we don't want to confuse that there because actually um, the geometry in of a vector space has a more structure than this. They are incidence geometries, vector spaces are. We'll, I'll give you some clarification on that in a moment. But there's also other geometric structure going on there uh, for which an incidence geometry in general doesn't have. So I'm not a big fan of that term, although it is used. So in our lecture series, we will refer to this as an incidence geometry. Uh, some people call it an incident system or something like that. Uh, but that's, again, starting to sound more combinatorial and less geometric. So we'll, we'll call this an incidence geometry in our language here. And so going forward for this video and other videos, you might want to copy down uh, these incidence axioms and put them in a notebook as you're studying geometry here, because we're going to refer back to them over and over and over again. But rarely are you going to see them on the screen. So take a moment, pause the video if necessary, and copy these before we go on. So next, what I want to do is actually discuss some examples of incidence geometry for which uh, I've mentioned them already, but let's be more specific here. 
Three-point and four-point geometry, which we discussed in lecture three, are examples of instance geometry. The five-point geometry that we discussed in the homework, at least for my students, if you've been following the videos and not doing the homework, then you might not know what that is. But it's also an example of five-point geometry. Excuse me, five-point geometry is an example of incidence geometry. And then Fano and Young geometries that we did in lectures four and five are also examples of uh, incidence geometry. These are, these are examples of finite incidence geometries. What about an infinite incidence geometry? Well, I mentioned vector spaces a moment ago. The vector space R2, this is the Euclidean plane. This is sort of like the archetype of what a geometry is supposed to be, although there are many non-Euclidean geometries, which we'll talk about in other lectures, of course. But R2 is a incidence geometry. Incidence geometry, um, it does have points, it has lines, it has incidence. These are undefined terms. So to tell you that R2 is an incidence geometry, I need to interpret the undefined terms. What is a point? What is a line? What is incidence? And then with that interpretation, argue why the four axioms are then statements, why they're, why they're true statements, I should say. So what is a point in the set R2? Well, R2 is it's the Cartesian product between R and R. Every um, every element of the set R2 is an ordered pair, X and Y, where X and Y are real numbers. It's very common convention that when you talk about a geometry, you denote it as a set, and that set is the set of points. So ordered pairs X, comma, Y, those are points in the geometry. Again, common convention that when we refer to a geometry, we refer to it by the set of points, and then the set of lines and incidence is implicit. It's not specifically stated, although we have to be very, we have to be explicit at this moment so you know what that means. So a point is just an ordered pair. It's an element of the set R2. What is a line? A line in this interpretation is actually a linear equation, AX plus BY equals C. Uh, where, of course, A, B, and C are not all zero. Two of them could be zero. One of them could be zero. None of them could be zero. But they can't all be zero. That's not considered a linear equation. I guess I should say um, A and B can't both be zero. C could be zero. I don't care. But A and B can't both be zero, which uh, that, that's the problem. A and B are never both zero. Otherwise, it's not, a, it's not a linear equation. And so linear equations are lines. And this is really... When we get down to this to the, the basics here, that's why we call these linear equations, because linear equations give us lines. We often like to think of like an analytic geometry, the graph of a linear equation is a line, hence why we call this a linear equation. We're kind of going the other way around here. We're saying a line is this equation. You can call it the graph if you want to, but I didn't want to get into anything like that. But the line is this equation. Okay, and because there are equivalent equations uh, that give us the same solution set, basically, uh, one has to be a little bit more careful because you could have multiple lines. So really, we have to place an equivalence relation on this. We're really talking about the graph of the line that that the graph of the linear equation. That's what a line is. But I'm not trying to get too much into the into the uh, too much of the details here. Uh, incidence is then defined to be a point is incident to a line if it's a solution to that line. That is, if you plug in X and Y and it satisfies the equation, that's incidence. Um, and that would then, we can then show that this is an incidence geometry. What are the, what are the axioms again? Let's go back up. So any two distinct points determine a unique line. And this is a practice you do in like college algebra, intermediate algebra. Uh, you know, previous algebra classes, you do you, you do such a thing. It's like, oh, I have a line x1, y1, and I have a second point x2, y2. Um, if these two points live on the same vertical line, it's pretty easy to determine what that point is. But if not, if they're not on the same vertical line, then you can compute their slope, you can use point slope form, put in slope intercept form, yada yada. You can construct the line that contains both of them, and that will be the only line that contains them. Do lines contain, do lines take at least two points? In this geometry, all lines have infinitely many points, uncountably many points, frankly. Do points exist? Yes, there's uncountably many points, but that's at least three. And then not all points lie on the same line. Uh, any line you construct, give me any equation, I can find you something that doesn't solve it. So give, give the equation AX plus BY equals C. Can I construct something that's not a solution? Well, if C is not zero, then notice the point zero, zero is not on a line. That's pretty simple. Now, if C is zero, 
Um, then by assumption A and B, they can't both be zero. So without the loss of generality, um, you know, we can assume we can assume that A is not zero in that situation, for which then use the point. Uh, then we use the point something like a, a, a one zero, something like that. Because then when you evaluate, you're just going to get A. Um, a, which is not zero, which is equal, is not equal to C, so it doesn't work. And so I mean, I, I'm not trying to dive too much in the details here, but there's a every line has a point not on it. You can construct it, uh, and so the four axioms of instance are satisfied. So R two is in fact an instance geometry. But I want to make mention that this argument about R two wasn't really specific to R two. What if I moved on to R three, R four, R five, R six? These higher dimensional vector spaces. This idea of incidence makes sense there as well, for which a point is just an element of the vector space. So a point is just a vector. That's something you typically see in linear algebra. Points are vectors. It's just this interpretation right here. Now, in that situation, what's a linear equation? Uh, well, there's actually a lot of ways you can interpret it. You could say like a linear, excuse me, you know what a linear equation, what's a line? Um, a line usually in the usually of course in the linear algebra setting a line is then going to be the the set spans by a single vector uh you know you get something like a line is going to be y is equal to you know you have some t x plus b or something like that where this is some fixed vector and this uh, this one right here is allowed to vary. And so anything of this form forms a line. You can think of that way. And that usually, and that's that's the way we think of it in Euclidean geometry in higher dimensions. But there's nothing that stops you from taking a hyperplane and be like, oh, um, AX plus BY plus CZ, whatever, D. You could call this linear equation a line uh, for which incidence would make the same, would make the same sense. Um, the four axioms will be satisfied. Now, again, I use the word hyperplane, like this is a three-dimensional example, so I'm thinking of a plane. Those aren't lines, right? But we haven't really defined what plane is, what a hyperplane is, what's dimension. Um, at the moment, we're really only talking about points, lines, and incidents, okay? And so linear equations in these higher dimensions could be interpreted as lines because they behave the same way that the incidence axioms seem to be telling us. Um, they have at least two points. Uh, there's at least three points in the geometry. There's not one linear equation which has everything satisfied with the exception of um, the zero equation where everything is zero. You know, something like that. That would satisfy, but we're not talking about that one. We said that, oh, these coefficients can't all be zero. And that's the thing is we don't want that one. Uh, and so, in some essence, in these higher dimensional Euclidean geometries, if we just stop at the four axioms of incidence, I could interpret a plane as a line. I could interpret a hyperplane as a line. We don't want that in higher dimensions. So we have to specify what's the difference between a line or a plane or whatever. Now, in this lecture series, I want you to be aware that we really aren't going to distinguish... Well, I, I should say we really aren't going to leave two-dimensional geometry. We're not going to dwell upon things like planes and higher dimensions. We're just going to stick ourselves just to planar geometry. So the geometries we talk about are a single plane. Um, and so we really aren't going to talk about these higher ones, but they are interpreted as incidence geometries. And if we're not careful, there's multiple interpretations we can put on the same set. That is, we take the same points, but we interpret lines differently. We get different incidence geometries. Uh, we want to we wanna watch out for such things. And so while R2, the interpretation we have here, is exactly the one we want, in higher dimensions, it can get a little bit weird. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll be focusing just on planar geometry here. In the next video, I want to start proving theory about incidence geometry, in which these are going to be theorems that are true for every incidence geometries, every incidence geometry, including the ones we've already discussed in this lecture series.